In this episode, we're going to talk about Pee Wee Herman, God rest his soul. He passed away just recently. We're going to explain why raw milk is awesome and wonder why it's illegal. And then are nukes even real? Do those even exist? Or is it all just a figment of our imagination or a fraud like the moon landing? And then I'm going to talk about why persistence always pays off. Okay. Before we do that, actually, Chorus is going to open us up with the show and tell. One of his uh, inheritance says. All right. So I thought I would show you guys this week. Let's see if I can do it with the microphone. Uh, I recently got a hold of my grandfather's custom cattle brand that Heck he used yeah. back in Clayton, New Mexico in the 80s and 90s. I think it was mostly the 80s. Um, this was always notable to me because uh, my grandpa's property in Albuquerque, when he came back and, and kind of put away the cowboy life, he still used the symbol to kind of like mark his belongings. He had it on his friend's on his fence in his property. And uh, growing up, as I decided to become a graphic designer, I thought, man, it would be really cool to eventually do my own uh, cattle brand myself. I don't know if you can see, it's WHF for Wallace Harold Franklin. So that was his full name. What a guy. Anyway, uh, I was recently given the opportunity to design a custom cattle brand for a member of Gabby's family. So I feel like it was kind of timely, like full circle. I finally got to do it myself and I got a hold of this one here. So it's a part of my heritage and uh, weirdly kind of inspired me to graphic, be a graphic designer. Not, not exactly cowboy material, but I could do something like that. So That's awesome. I thought I would share that with you guys. Thanks for sharing, man. That's awesome. You see, he was a cattle rancher. He was a cattle rancher. He actually took a job out in uh, New Mexico as a P&M rep to run P&M out there. Okay. And uh, I guess in his free time, the ranchers kind of took him under their wing and taught him how to do cattle ranching, which was a dream he had his whole life. That's awesome. So became a full blown cowboy, and then eventually moved back to Albuquerque and had to had to put away the the cowboy in. Okay, very cool. All right, before we start the show, couple announcements. The show is brought to you by Saint Poncho, my mother's candles. You can find them on the shop. Um, I think it's just chadbarilla.com slash St. Poncho. I think it's ST hyphen Poncho. Um, when you buy the candles, you support the show. We appreciate it very much. Buy a candle, light it up when you uh, listen to the podcast. That's fun. It's a little family um, effort. She hand pours these things in Bosky Farms, as you see there. Um, yeah, we got like 10 cents. We're burning the Cedar Crest right now, a local favorite. But yes, and then also, there will be, these will be available right now, actually. These are a few pieces made from greens. These are uh, some rings and some cuffs. Sonoran gold are these top ones here, and then uh, some of the rings. And then I've got some Royston, classic Nevada turquoise, and then some Fox. But yeah, these are live now. So if you're interested in getting first dibs, you can get first dibs. And then during the show, somewhere in the show, I'm going to give you a secret um, discount code that'll work for both the candles and these pieces. Uh, With that, let's get into the show. Welcome back to For Goodness Sake. I am Chad Barella. We have Chorus uh, pushing the buttons over there. What's up, everybody? Welcome back. I just got back from Spanish market slash contemporary Hispanic market in Santa Fe. I just got back last night. Was a wild time. Look at this thing, by the way. Chorus ordered a couple of these for the show. Let us know if you want one. We'll make more. Um, but yeah, it was a crazy time. Got to meet tons of awesome people in Santa Fe um, and show some of my jewelry. What else? You, you had a good weekend? Oh, yeah. It was a great time. Good. Nothing too notable. But, oh, actually, no, we had a family reunion, so that was fun. <laughs> and Oops. if your family's <laughs> listening. Wasn't my side. <laughs> okay, fair enough. Your family's insulted. Um, cool. Let's get into it. So, so Pee Wee, what's his real name? 
It looks like his real name is Paul Rubens, and his obviously his stage name, Pee Wee, probably a take on that. Oh, okay. I don't think anybody knew him by his actual name. We all knew him by Pee Wee Herman. His Christian name. His Christian name, not his other name. <laughs> <laughs> You're baiting so hard, dude. Um, what do we have in the Twitter Twitter feed? What's going on live? Well, this is going to be contra- there's going to be some controversial stuff popping up, I'm sure, because of this because is, of uh, his life and his heritage and his everything here. What does this say? We absolutely love Paul Rubens. I never heard that name but in my life. Whether he was delighting audiences as the iconic Pee Wee Herman or being given the honorary Muppet Award in Muppet Magazine. Oh, I didn't know that. In 1987, he brought a burst of joy, creativity, and laughter everywhere he went. Very cool. What else do we got here? This is, this is live populating, okay? So it could be good, could be bad. When Paul Rubens hosted... NBC SNL, oh, he's, of course he did that, uh, 1985. When did he introduce the character? I, I know the earliest we saw is like somewhere around 1983. Yeah, 1980s, uh, and then an HBO special in 81. I don't want to dishonor his name, but um, that character is really creepy. What could motivate a man to want to create a character like that? I guess you could ask the same question about, well... This is this gets into funny territory because you know I don't want to dishonor the dead. But did you ever you watch that movie? Uh, I think I I watched one of the movies like clips of it because my dad was trying to explain what Pee Wee Herman was to me. Uh, but I don't really remember. I remember being kind of un- uncomfortable. So how does your dad uh, explain what who Pee Wee is to you? My dad is just he is a product of the 1980s. And so, he, like, his primary duty as a father was just making me understand what happened in the 80s. Uh, so, so this was part of, like, the pop culture phenomenon of the 80s. Can you um, role play your dad and the audience is you? How would he explain who Pee Wee is? Uh, I think he's, I can't remember exactly, but he's like, he's like this goofy little guy who acts like a little kid on, like, a tricycle. He's got his bow tie. And he probably would imitate the voice. I can't remember how he would do it. And was your dad creepy or creeped out by him or not? I Probably think, not. I think my dad and I remember him and my uncles explaining what Pee Wee Herman was to me. And I think they were mostly just like, this is a weird thing that happened. <laughs> it was just like, you know. And it's weird because, you know, in your most flexible mindset, you can watch Pee Wee's Big Adventure. I can. And it's like, oh, this is entertainment. This is just theater. But then you kind of get a little more in your mind about it and you're like, what drives a person to make a character like that? That is such a creepy character. And not only that's like, expo- it's not a kid's character. I guess it's, he, it's an, an adult, not adult, but, <laughs> but a, a character that um, appeals to adults it as well. It appeals to adults, but it's like all themed as if it's like a kid's show, maybe. Yeah. And then you get like Tim, did he do, is this, did he, yeah, I guess he, what is Tim Burton? Tim Burton. Did he direct some of his films? I think oh, so, okay. right? He, I think he did the big adventure. That makes sense. Yeah. I don't know much about Tim Burton other than the creepy movies that he does. He's a different creepy. Uh, yes. Directed by Tim Burton. Mm-hmm. Uh, Pee Wee's Big Adventure in 1985. It's a good movie. It's an interesting movie. It's an Americana movie. Like it or not, at this point it is. They visit the Alamo. I guess that... Um, is it on par with the Alamo? Is that how you would characterize your Grand it's Canyon? It's on par with the Alamo. Alamo Pee Wee Herman. <laughs> no, no, no. No, but I mean, he goes across America and visits all these different iconic America sites, but he's definitely a part of America, America's history. There you go. 19, oh, that's nice. That's a nice tribute to him, you know? Yeah, maybe that's, that's a good way to go out. Well... We're going to miss you, Pee Wee. Gosh, I'm so mean. I really don't know how to, I mean, obviously, I don't know how to feel about it. Well, uh, here, look, I'm going to say, it's not a national tragedy, okay? But I don't, I don't think I'd have hated him. No, I'm not saying I hate the dude either, but there's some people that I'd feel like, like when Prince died, that was a weird day for me. I played a lot of Prince that day, and I'm not even a huge Prince fan. A lot of people mourned Prince. Yeah, that was weird. It's kind of like... You know, a lot of people probably feel it's kind of like a Michael Jackson type, type day. No? 
just because the I allegations. Don't know. Yeah, I mean, I'm not al- saying I'm not saying it okay, is. Okay, maybe the allegations, but I, Michael I don't Jackson, believe- I feel like had a better impact on pop culture than Pee Wee. Better, explain that. Like there are artists today that are still trying to emulate what Michael did on records. Yeah, you know, way back then, and like what him and Quincy Jones accomplished together. Pee Wee Herman was like a funny thing that happened in the '80s, but it's like you know that happened then. Do you think that um, MJ did it? Did all these things? Are you trying to get me in trouble? No. Because uh, you already got me in trouble, dude. Maybe we'll just let the whole thing fly. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I, don't, I tend to think that he didn't do it. Uh, I watched a couple interviews of. I'm there too. Um, of some of the kids that supposedly were survivors and basically said like their dad put them up to it or it was like a money making scheme. Or their mom, some lawyer approached them, something like that. Yeah. So, I, I mean, I think he was a weird dude for sure. Like, yeah. he, like, you, you need to do your due diligence to not be... Don't put yourself in a position where allegations can be made. Yeah. Period. Um, but I think that people took advantage of him because he was so weird. There was a clip I just recently saw, actually. It was like... Um, was it Nick? That guy that did that, I want candy. He like uh, renewed that song that was like 15 years ago. Nick, he was one of the Disney kids. Mm. He recently passed away, actually, suspiciously. After he was like, Kanye, talk, get in touch with me. But um, a lot of crazy lore around that. But there was a clip where he was talking about how he got baited into outing Michael Jackson or trying to lie about him. That's so crazy. Yeah. I feel like if he was that bad of a dude, it, it, I feel like it would have been more of a Bill Cosby situation where like the floodgates just opened. But there's been so much back and forth throughout the whole th- situation. Yeah. Gosh, what was his name? Nick? It's not Nick Cannon, of course. Was it like Aaron? Nick Aaron? No, yes. It's Aaron Carter. Aaron, Aaron Carter. Carter. Nick Carter and Aaron Carter, but it was Aaron Carter. Um, you should look for it on Twitter or wherever. Aaron Carter, Michael Jackson. But there was like an interview clip of uh, Aaron Carter talking about how his, these people were trying to get him to tell on or like not tell on because that insinuates that he actually did something, but to incriminate Michael Jackson because they'd hung out. You know, he said they smoked weed together or something, which would be the worst uh, thing that he said, but which even still is kind of weird. It's like you're smoking weed with a kid. That, that's weird. No doubt. But yeah, I don't, I don't know. I think he was emotionally deprived. He was stuck in his child emotional state. But that's not to say that he was an, a, a sexual deviant. But uh, yeah, did you see anything? Uh, it's it's like too buried between like the original news articles and okay, no worries. Yeah, I'm like in the weeds on it. <laughs> so there's this thread I came across uh, a few days ago on raw milk and the the um, the health benefits, and I think it's quite interesting that we're not allowed to. It's illegal to sell. Uh, in certain states at least, um, to humans or for human consumption. But this thread was, uh, let's just read it. It says, before 1890, all milk in the U.S. was raw and unpasteurized. Now, it's labeled as dangerous. Here's the truth surrounding the amazing benefits of raw milk. Beautiful photo. I mean, hasn't, hasn't it been, by the way, throughout human history that humans have been, pretty much throughout human history, that humans have been consuming milks uh, milks, cow's milk, raw. And then all of a sudden in 1890 and then uh, in the early 1900s, it becomes like illegal to drink raw milk. And of course it was because of diseases or certain things. And But anyways, let's keep reading. Uh, in this thread, you're going to learn why raw milk is superior to pasteurized milk, the story behind making pasteurization the standard, what the difference is between raw and pasteurized milk are. Let's dive in. Okay. So what exactly is raw milk? Well, it's the milk right out of the tit. (laughs) I love that. Of the cow. What about me, Greg? Can you milk me? Um, No pasteurization, no homogenization, homogenization, uh, little to no alteration. Pretty simple. Have you ever milked a cow, Mr. Cattle Rancher? No, and I hope I never have the privilege of milking a cow. No, I, I don't s- think I would do it. I haven't either, but I, I'd be honored 
My wife is convinced that I'm going to be a farmer a someday. Uh, I just don't see really? it. Really? Yeah, she wants, she wants to do the whole thing. Good. Good, so do I. I don't think Bree wants to move out to the... To the... To the boonies? Nope. So it'd have to be a part-time thing, which you can't do a part-time cattle rancher thing. Um, earliest occurrence of humans drinking milk dates back to the at least 6,000 years ago. Oh, there you go. India, Greece, Egypt, ancient Hebrews, Arabs, Romans. Civilizations from different regions uh, and of different beliefs, all known from, for praising the wondrous miracle of raw cow's milk. Hmm, the land of milk and honey. It's even in scripture. Even the founder of Mayo Clinic, Dr. J.R. Crew, wrote an essay titled The Milk Cure. Real milk cures many diseases. Huh. Who'd have thunk? Where he notes curing thousands of patients of a multitude of different diseases through the, an exclusive raw milk diet. That's crazy. Now I have, now, now, now I'm, I'm on, it's, what's funny is I'm actually come full circle. When I was, um, Probably 12, 13 years ago, I, there was a website. I wonder if it's still around. You should look it up, notmilk.com. Uh, there was a website called notmilk.com that kind of talked about all the ills of milk and how it's kind of disgusting, actually, how it's harvested, at least in modern day. But when you think about it, when you're drinking milk today in its current, the way it's, you, when you're not getting it directly from the cow or in a small batch situation, you're drinking like hundreds or thousands of, of cow's milk who are on antibiotics and all kinds of different things. And so you're getting all of that. Whereas if you get it from one single source, it seems a lot more natural. So what is this? It just says, According to notmilk.com, there is no nutritional need for cow's milk for humans. <laughs> it's funny because I used to say this. I used to think it was gross. And it's actually true. If you think about it, there is no animal after they wean off the teat uh, that they continue drinking milk as adults. For the most part, that's in, in, in nature. You don't normally see that. There's also not any animals that use electricity or have indoor plumbing, so it's kind of hard to make that comparison. Good point. We need, to, we need to abandon the show. All right. <laughs> see you guys. <laughs> that's it. <laughs> uh, no. Um, so yeah, I used to go and, and on this website, I used to kind of be like, oh, milk is disgusting. And that was when I was literally a soy boy. I'm not even kidding, dude. And then come full, I'm not even kidding, dude. I would do soy chais and stuff when I worked at Starbucks. Sorry, I'm, I've, I'm very embarrassed right now. I'm not even kidding. Um, but now I'm like, no, dude, raw milk. Sounds good. And if my kids are going to have milk, I'm not saying they're drinking raw milk. They have had it, actually. Um... I know of a place. I'm not, no. I'm actually, I think, probably get in trouble. Uh, I don't know anything about raw milk, okay? Don't talk to me about it. But um, let's keep reading the thread. Uh, so why have the archives been lost? What made raw milk dangerous in the days of the experts? Well, like many things involving the government, there's more to the narrative than meets the eye. Here's a thread on the full story. I don't want to read the whole story here, but essentially... Actually, no, I do, because this is the next clip. Let's go to that thread. The other thread there in the last tweet. Up. That one, yeah. Harry Gray. So this is a different thread here. It says, lies, death, and corporate greed. Essentially arguing that um, corporations wanted to put it out here. Let's see what it says. At the, I can't see the top. At the beginning of the 19th century, cities in America and Europe grew at an astronomical rate. New York went from a population of 77,000 in 1790 to 650,000 in 1856. At the same time, pasture, uh, pasture land in urban areas shrank. Shrink is a funny word. And demand for quality food stressed the, lo the food system. Refrigeration was only invented in 1913. That's weird to think of a world without refrigeration. Ice as well, by the way. Cray. And the need for accessible food near cities played a huge factor in supporting urban growth. The proximity to food sources became more challenging the faster the and larger cities grew. 
1646, Boston reserved land specifically for raising cattle. But by the 1830s, uh, they banned cattle from grazing in the city, what's now known as the Boston Common. So I don't know if this thread actually goes into it, but there was another thing I came across that essentially said um, one of the two speeches, one of the Rothschild, now if you know the Rothschilds, we've talked about them before. Uh, they're, they're one of the families you can't really talk ill about. But the Lord Rothschild's um, prominent banking family, the central bankers out of uh, Europe, but um, apparently there was two major speeches that one of these Rothschilds made, and one of them was in regards to the pasteurization of milk. Very sus. Um, and sure enough, we can't even drink raw milk anymore. That's too bad because there's a girl, uh, there's a story uh, out right now about a girl who not only doesn't drink raw milk, like she should have, but she doesn't eat any animal, anything. She was a vegan, and sadly, she passed away. Vegan raw food diet influencer Zana Diart dies of starvation. This is a really death-heavy episode. We started with the light stuff with Pee Wee, and now we're getting into the weeds on uh, veganism. Play the video. So this girl, you know, she's a really skinny influencer encouraging others not to eat protein, animal protein. No nuts even. Crazy, man. Watch it. If you keep going here a little bit, you'll see different pictures, different videos of her. You got that thing popping up on the corner? Or is that... It's like in can't get browser. it to go away? Bummer. Oh, that's the only part of the video? Yeah, it looks like it. Oh, bummer. Whoa. Oh, okay. I was going to have you scroll. Look at that. That's her. Oh, dude. She's skinny. It doesn't take an expert to say that that's not healthy. <laughs> I don't think so. Like, you don't have real friends if if someone's not telling you you need to look out for yourself. Not at all. Let's do a few more. Keep going a little bit. Man. Well, you were telling me a story um, a little bit ago about somebody else who was an activist, a vegan activist. and uh, Yeah, that was making the rounds a few years ago. She was a vegan activist for a long time, and I think she had an internet following for it. Uh, but was getting to this point, was getting super sick. She said she was like getting pale and had no energy. Mm. And uh, she was going to the doctor trying to figure out what was wrong. And the doctors keep telling her, like, you need animal protein. Like, we're omnivores. There's no way to get around it. If you want to stay alive, you need to eat some kind of animal protein. And she said she had this, like, really hard, heartbreaking moment where she just finally had to eat a piece of chicken. Like, first time in, like, decades. Wow. And uh, she said the second she ate the chicken, like the life just like flowed back into her. And so she started to try to open up to her friends in the community and basically say like, hey, you need to supplement a little bit. Like we, we can still be vigilant about animal cruelty and, you know, the way food is raised, but this isn't a long-term solution. It's just not like she was literally dying. Mm -hmm. And the sad part is this community totally turned against her ousted her and and was really cruel to her to the point where she kind of became like an anti-vegan because the whole like mindset the whole worldview just turned on her the second she tried to speak out about the life-saving effects of animal protein yeah what else did i miss anything else on this is there on the notes i don't have the notes with me uh not as far as the i'm out of order not as far as the uh protein milk stuff goes. I think we're caught up. Okay. All right, let's move on. So an internet debate has been sparking over the last week or so, thanks to Owen Benjamin, who is now questioning whether or not nukes are real. What do you think? Of course, we were all raised to believe that nukes are real, and it turns out they're not. It's all fake. Do you have the video? 
Did the United States fake the nuclear test video? What happened to the cameras while everything else was blasted away? These look like tiny model houses like Star Wars pre-CG. So we're looking at supposed camera footage of uh, test buildings being blown over by nukes. That's yes. what this is, right? Yes, and it's supposed to be essential. Essentially, um, they're presenting it as proof nukes can't be real because if these houses are so blown away, how is it that the cameras are fine? We have a community note here. Yes, it says the U.S. nuclear test programs use several techniques to capture the blast effects. Cameras were placed in thick concrete bunkers, lead lines, steel boxes, and 18-foot poles to get above the dust. This is all well documented. More details in Reuters, which, funny enough, at one point was owned by the, Rock, uh, the Rothschilds. I'm not kidding. Uh, I don't know. They're not anymore, allegedly. Um, what do you think about that? I think it'd be great if we lived in a world where nukes weren't real, but I'm not that much of an optimist, I don't think. You know, when I first he heard it, uh, gosh, I, listen, I, I think nukes, nukes are real, right? <laughs> I actually don't know what to believe at this moment in time. If they're not, we're spending a lot of money on something at Sandia Labs, and I have no idea what. The only reason I'm like a little bit more like iffy right now is because that community notes thing didn't persuade me actually um it's not to say that's not true i don't know listen it's they're probably real all right nukes are real but owen benjamin and i don't necessarily put a lot of weight on owen benjamin because he has been a little crazy on certain things but owen benjamin just to give you a little background he is he was formerly he used to be on like he's a comedian um he used to be in the mainstream and Till he like just he was one of the more colorful guys. He used to be on Stephen Crowder's show, Louder with Crowder. Um, made he he been on Joe Rogan's show actually. He's been on um the podcast. Um, but yeah, he kind of started talking about things he wasn't supposed to talk about, saying words he wasn't supposed to say. So he was one of the early guys to get banned. In fact, one of the first. And um. And then he went off and said, oh, the moon landing was faked. And that got him banned. And then people started saying, oh, you're crazy. And then he started saying the earth was flat. Then he started saying, he started like every one of them. He was just saying, yep, these were all real. And so... Um, do you think he does it out of defiance because he got canceled? Or does, do you think he believes all this stuff? What I, honest, I honestly think he, he, he does believe the moon landing was fake. I think he really honestly believes that the uh, Earth is flat. I think he honestly believes that nukes don't exist. I, and we'll, we'll watch a video here explaining kind of why it is. But I, I, think, that, I think he went through a life-traumatizing experience, of, and it broke his trust. And it did drive him into a... This is my guess... I like the guy. I think he's very funny. But I think he did get driven into like kind of a psychosis or some sort of like, um, I think he lost a sense of reality. And I can sympathize with him to a degree because, you know, he lost his whole life. You know, everything he pr previously knew, like he went all in on, on, on a, a few things and was one of the real early persecuted as far as like thought crimes and things like that. And so I think it really messed with his head. And I think it, it affected his inner, you know, we have like this inner ability to trust and engage um, reality, whether or not it's a good gauge. Everybody gauges a little different. But based on, on like the general population, trust, the, I, wouldn't, I don't know if they, is this true or not? You tell me, trust the government. Do you think that's true? I think a lot of people want to trust the government. And they're kind of rooting for it, even if they're opposed to a lot of the legislation and the way things are being run. But, I, you know, I think all I brought that up to say was that I think a lot of trust can very well be misplaced in the wrong places, in people and all these different things. And I think that his was not so much placed in those things, but after going through kind of the, con the cancel, the trauma, I think he got kind of put in this weird like nothing's real anymore i don't trust anything and so we had to throw it all out and kind of start back over and so i think that might be driving some of his thinking and this is just my speculation of course 
from a favorable view of the guy. I think he's funny, likable, very rude. But here's a, this, you'll get an idea of, 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 what, of who he is and kind of his personality through this. This was on his show, this was a little what clip. What is it about society that disappoints you so much? Oh, I don't know. Is it that we collectively thought Steve Jobs was a great man, even when we knew he made billions off the backs of children? Or maybe it's that it feels like all our heroes are counterfeit. The world itself's just one big hoax. The heck was that? Damning each other with our running commentary bullshit. Obama? Great yeah. Insight. I don't know. Our social we'll have media to look it up. faking is intimacy. Or is it that we voted for this? Not with our rigged elections, but with our things, our property, our money. I'm not saying anything new. We all know why we do this. Not because Hunger Games books makes us happy, but because we want to be sedated. Because it's painful not to pretend. Because we're cowards. Fuck society. Real quick, so this is 1968 on BBC. This is Owen Benjamin talking. This is a year before the fake moon landing. They fucking told everybody. And they do that for a variety of reasons. One, according to their religion, they relieve themselves of their karmic responsibility. Because if you tell people and you make it available, you're not trapping people, it's consent driven. And then later when people watch it and realize that they've been tricked the whole time, it's a demoralization tactic. This is called Newsbenders from 1968. This wasn't made by a bunch of truthers. This is the fucking BBC told you this. And you still did it. You're going to make this happen. No. We are going to make models. So pause it real quick. Much cheaper. So Andrew Tate, there was a clip that came out maybe even a year ago, almost a year ago, where he was talking about the same principle. Now, I don't know. He said, Owen Benjamin said, it's according to their religion, it's um, karmic relief that they have to tell you what they're doing to you. And uh, Andrew Tate said something similar, but he was talking about Satanists. <laughs> he was saying that Satanists have to tell you what they're doing to you. It's like, um, you have to know that when you drink a soda, and when you do these things, you smoke cigarettes, you know it's giving you cancer. It says it right there on the box. That they relieve themselves of the karmic, uh, their karma and their responsibility. And uh, that's kind of what he's saying, is that, that what they're doing is telling you. They tell you all the time. This is what they're doing. This is what they're doing. This is what we're doing. We're doing this to you. And uh, now, take it with a grain of salt. You know, he's talking about the moon landing. He's talking about all these different things, because that was in 1968. And now, of course, a lot of things we've discovered over the last few years, we've been lied to about. Significant things. Many people don't believe the official narrative of COVID, the official narrative of 9-11, the official narrative of you name it. And honestly, you shouldn't because it's, it is bullshit. It's not real. Did you remember 9-11? Here's an example. The official narrative that was in the 9-11 Commission report or whatever it was called was that a passport fell and somebody found the passport of one of these hijackers on the ground in New York City after the f airplane had gone into the building and uh, heated the steel enough to melt the steel beams for the building to collapse. But somebody was able to manage to find that passport, that paper passport on the ground. That's, come on, I mean, at least a little bit. Now, come on, that's, there's no way. They throw it out the window as soon as he, you know, hit the, hit the building, or right before he hit the building. There's no way that passport would have gotten out. In my opinion. Um, to get back to it, he's kind of talking about the karmic, uh, relieving themselves of the karma, that Satanists have to tell you what they're doing to you, and that you have to consent to it. It's like Disney, and the movies, and the agenda. And you still pay for it. Target, all these different things. And you still pay for it. So you're paying for it with your property. I thought that was powerful. Let's keep listening, though. Real quick, why don't you clarify, Chad? Yeah. Are you saying that Satanists, that you think they need to have this karmic exchange? Or are you explaining what they maybe believe? 
I think what they believe, this is what Andrew Tate was talking about, uh, that there is a degree of, now, of moral underpinnings to the religion. It's like, I a, don't, like a warped moral compass, right? Like there, yeah. there are like guidelines that they're playing in that could potentially explain why certain behaviors are happening. Yeah, that they relieve themselves of their karmic responsibility because they told you and you did it anyway. So you're responsible. So when you continue down this path, you know, you're, you know your McDonald's is killing you and you, you're doing it anyway. Well, they can do it to you. Not saying the McDonald's are Satanists, but you know, it's that idea of um, you know what you're doing, therefore you have the responsibility, not the person uh, who presented or tempted you or enticed you into that type of activity. Something along those lines. I'd like, we'll, have, you know, we'll have to find that um, Andrew Tate clip, but that's kind of what Owen Benjamin's talking about. And he says a religion. I'm curious, this, I would be curious to ask what religion, but. Fake news reels. Yes, fake news reels. For the past 10 years, people have been looking at our fake news reels and listening to our fake commentaries. And they accept it for the truth. And you can do it. For those who are just listening, we're looking at Stop 100 people in the sound street. footage of NASA landings and miniature sets. That they're just told so they believe that there's no such thing as satellites. They go far. I'm telling you, they go really, really, really far. There were all these things whizzing about and I'm not with them, uh, for the record. <laughs> but it makes you think. Crossing their legs for eight days. How long has this been going on? Since Hiroshima. See, that's the point where he's and, like. And the H bomb, you mean? That doesn't work either. Right. Dirty. Very, very dirty. What was your first reaction? Relief. Oh, yes. We're looking at yes, miniature absolutely. sets of cities being blown over. You say you can put out what pictures you like on television. Doesn't anybody try to stop you? No, nobody wants to. 99.386% of the population wouldn't believe this conversation. And the rest are working for us. And they're the top minds, the really responsible people. Scare an ostrich, it buries its head in the sand. If you scare a hedgehog, it rolls itself up into a ball. When a woman's frightened, she goes out and buys herself a hat. You mean you scare us so that we'll buy more, so that, so that money moves quicker, production moves up? We don't say scare when we talk about human beings. We say uh, threaten them emotionally. And there are all sorts of ways, of do not just the big ones like the hydrogen bomb. Overcrowd them a little with bad planning. Sell them too many motor cars, anything to keep them a little bit removed from reality. Sounds like the George W. Nowadays, Bush quote about it's our duty to get back and uh, buy things. That's the, that was our mm. duty, right? They don't even love for love. Well, it connects to kind of what we were talking about with Rockefeller and being involved in uh, Big Pharma with pet petroleum and all these different things, wanting to monetize. To find a non-addictive drug. The same thing with uh, seed oils. LSD. You much pause. A lot of the seed oils, uh, I think, is uh, rapeseed oil, uh, is not meant for human consumption. Originally, it's one of these oils. And that it was actually for engine, uh, car engines. And uh, they wanted to figure out a way to make it more, make it edible by uh, humans by genetically modifying it. So they genetically modified this, uh, this oil to make it profitable. Now, of course, it's really bad for the human. And now we're seeing the consequences of it. They're outlawed in other countries. Many of these genetically modified foods, of course, we went over that in one of the episodes before. And it, it's just interesting that a lot of our society has become corrupted, perverted, to say the least, for the sake of profit. And the humanity behind it all has been lost. It was with the Rockefellers, no, I don't want to pin it all on them, but I think it's, it's in us all to a degree. Um, and we do consent to it. I do believe we only go as far as we're willing to go, willing to let them go. So a lot of people would say, like, that's the problem with our way of life, right? That is the end result of a capitalistic society 
and we're prone to evil and so we should live in in a socialist you know utopia at best and at worst at a socialist you know alternative state what would you say to that like is this just is this what happens in a free society Hmm. you know this is something i'm actually really really chewing on what is what is real freedom because there's this idea like i just want to be free from all my responsibilities free from all these different things i don't want to be free from um serving my government masters or whatever it is but what is true is that is impossible that type of freedom is impossible you're gonna have to serve somebody now may it be god the father and his laws and his way or it's going to be the devil straight up and it's in his many forms and so to answer your question it's hard dude i'm i'm, I'm in a weird place i'm like chewing on this idea of like of liberty and freedom is like is it um what does that mean? What did the founders mean by that? Because they, they, they believed in, in an objective moral law. Some people would pervert freedom to say it, it's to uh, be outside of the bounds of any sort of moral law, to, to promote godly, godlessness in effect. That's, that's kind of what I'm wondering. Is like, what, what, when we say freedom, what do we mean? Like when we all, you know, promote freedom, I think, I think the right tends to mean, okay, we mean Christian, a Christian standard and uh, freedom from force. We don't want uh, government to force or coerce us into certain things. I agree with that. The government ought to be bound by God's law. But it, it just brings in so many things that I'm, I'm, I'm on that, I'm on that, um, track right now. I'm trying to understand because I've heard I've heard it said. You know, obviously, I, I, for my whole life, it was um, the socialists tend to be. They don't believe that you can manage your life as well as they can manage your life, and so they want to take away your right to manage your own life. And I've always been against that, and I am against that. Um, I am principally against that. But it is hard when you see society go the way that it is and people know what they're doing is, is killing them. There was a saying by the, uh, I forget who it was, Benjamin Franklin or something, it's a, a Republican, if you could keep it. And um, that it can only stand, that Americans really can only um, stand if on a moral public. But once you've lost your morality, you've got nothing. And we're in that place where we've lost our spine, we've lost our morality, we've lost our, our, our substance, our, our foundation. And it's almost as if we need, I'm not advocating this, but it's almost as if we need like strong leadership to get us back on track. Because forces, funny enough, in the wrong direction are forcing us in that wrong direction. How do you correct course? I don't know. I genuinely don't know. But as far as... Um, yeah, does that even answer your question? I think it does. Uh, like I'm, I'm kind of in... I don't know. I don't know. Like I used to be absolutely a non-aggression principle, no no force, liberty. But I'm <laughs> controversial. I'm open to the idea of a benevolent force of correction. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think ideologically it makes sense. It's hard for me to imagine a system that works better than ours. I mean, on paper... No system pulls people from poverty into wealth. And free market capitalism. And free market capitalism. I agree. And nothing extends the human life expectancy like. But here's what I'm capitalism. saying. This is great. This is a good exploration. Here's what I'm saying. 
Abraham Lincoln. He suspended the Constitution for a period of time. He shut down the printing press. No more bad press. He revoked the freedom of speech. He took forceful actions. If my history is correct, for the sake of correcting course. Now, didn't George Washington kind of do some similar things? I mean, didn't they want him to be the king? And he's like, no. No, no, no. But they, you know, they fought war. They did, took forceful actions. Now, you could argue they were in defense, defensive forceful actions. And maybe that's what I'm saying. I'm, I'm, I'm just merely wondering, what, what was it, the justification? Because we champion them, right? We champion George Washington. We champion Abraham Lincoln. We know the controversial things they did that they suspended the Constitution, therefore not acting in ultimate principle. Um, but because it was for the sake of good, now that's, that's risky territory. It's the ends justifying the means, right? And I'm not saying that. Just saying it's interesting stuff to think about. Does that, does that point, what do you think about that? Uh, Abraham Lincoln suspending... I think if you were Habeas looking Corp. for a relatable leader... That's not terrifying to make your point. Abraham Lincoln's probably the one. Um, Mm -hmm. Seems like a fluke that that didn't turn out an outright dictatorship by, you know, his predecessors. But he's a good example of that principle, right? That like backbone that you would need to correct a society maybe or to to swing the other way, Mm -hmm. you know, in in, in a really short order. Um, It seems to me that many, and this might be going down a rabbit hole, but it seems to me like many of these issues come back to the idea of crony capitalism. Um, these entities, these groups, these businesses have unfettered access to data. They have unfettered yeah. access to the American public, to our food supply, our water supply, education. And it, it happens because they're connected to government agencies, right? Mm-hmm. And so it seems like... This is, this is great. This is great because I think what you're explaining here is that we are being offended. There is a fight that has been picked. And it's, it's like this. To, to simplify it down, right? To, to dilute, not dilute it, but to, to simplify it down. When you're in, involved in like a battle, like a fight, for example, when you're on the street and some guy comes up to you and punches you in the face, and keeps wanting to punch you, keeps, keeps trying to fight you. Do you just let him beat you up? Or do you fight, your, fight back and defend yourself? Or, you know, a woman's walking across the street and you see her getting beat up. She's being um, accosted. Are you wrong for going to use force against the person um, fighting her, beating her up? So there's this idea, makes it really complicated, but uh, at what point is an offended society granted the right to defend itself? That's all I'm exploring. Because it's true. And, 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 and so much of, of what we understand are... are, are system of government to be has been taken from us, has been polluted, has been perverted, subverted. And at what point do we forcefully reinstitute? It's it's what it says in the, it literally says it in the Declaration of Independence, which is now a hate document. But when your government ceases from being these things, something along those lines, it is your duty to take it back and to reinstitute it. It's in the first lines of the Declaration of Independence, which is now deemed a hate document. That sounds pretty revolutionary. By revolution, it written by revolutionaries. Pretty wild stuff. I'm just saying, guys. We championed 1776, and that was a revolutionary act. They were literally causing a revolution. Not advocating anything here, YouTube. But uh, good food for thought. At what point, 
I've heard ca- I've heard people make cases, man. You know. <sighs> if you extrapolate out, right? I'm the man in my home. If there were forces that were in my home that I'd let in or not let in that were harming my family, it is my duty to defend them, to protect them. What do you do? Extrapolate that out. What do you do? What does that look like on a governmental plane? A few years ago, there was this interesting movement. Of course, it died out because it made too much sense for Congress to get behind or the American public. But there was this movement that found a constitutional provision that would allow the states to basically commandeer control back from D.C., um, basically under the understanding that the federal government doesn't even closely resemble the provisions. They're not, they're not providing the services. They're not doing the things that the Constitution outlines them to do. And they're doing all these other things that were originally allocated to be states' duties. And if a certain amount of, I think, governors and Congress uh, got on board, then there would be like a constitutional reset. And mm. all of the power and funding would be reallocated back to the states. And I was intrigued by that because it seemed like a way that in our, you know, kind of system of doing things that we could get back to a place where there would be normalcy and, you know, running for mayor would actually mean something. Running for city council would actually mean something. Mm-hmm. And you could actually build a society from the ground up that you would want to raise your kids in. But of course, that's something, it's not exciting. It's hard to put on a campaign slogan, so I don't think that's something we'd ever see in our lifetime. Mm. Well, what you explained is, is a, distribu- a distribution of power, which is what the United States was intended to be. It was a distribution of power. You got the three branches of government, and then all of the power wasn't supposed to be centralized on one person, which now it is through executive orders and, and the like. It doesn't go through Congress when we get into war. Like, we're, we're fighting a proxy war in Ukraine right now. Did Congress declare it? Therefore, the people declare it? The whole point was that the people who elect representatives would be the ones that would declare something, and they've subverted that. They've gone around that system. It doesn't resemble the system that was implemented. So at what point do people get mad, fed up, and say, you know, we need to invoke the Declaration of Independence? And, um, you know, I just, it's good, good, good question. I, you know, I, I, when you think about it in those terms, it's quite discouraging and, and frustrating. But principally, yeah, I'm, I believe in the principle of decentralization. The sad part is, is that's been stolen from us. We don't have that anymore. So I actually, I actually, I feel as if it is, uh, It's like you're driving a car and somebody literally hijacked your car and your family's in the car. What do you do? You just let that guy drive your car off the cliff? Or do you, you know, I'm just saying, I know the implications are intense, but, you know, logic says you take, you take the driver out. I'm not, <laughs> this kid, you know, and we're getting in the weeds, but this kid, uh, People could interpret this many ways. This is all theoretical, folks. Chill out. Yes. Chill out. In a video Stop game. white knuckling the steering wheel and just take a step. Yes. Back. I'm, I'm talking about this in a hypothetical in a video game. Um, enough of that. I think we're going to skip that last portion. Do we have any listener questions? We do. Let me get over to them. Well, that, 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 uh, that took a, a shape I wasn't expecting. Can you tell us about one of your major personal life role models, as in someone you've known or know personally? I've talked about him on the show. You know, positive male role models in my life would be my dad and a couple of my uncles, who I have talked about. The inspiration of my hat, Uncle Walker. Inspiration over here at the Santo. Um... Ghetto Monk, Gerald Martinez, both of whom are now with the Lord, and then, of course, my dad. 
who I just went and uh, did Spanish market with over the weekend. Uh, all those men have a strong, profound influence in my life. They represent masculinity, responsibility, love, determination, grit, humor, Wisdom, yeah, fun. All three of them were super fun guys. What's else? What's next? The next one says, "Do you have any regrets?" Do I have any regrets? I don't think I do. I think you live life and things that don't go the way they should. You know, it's funny. What was that clip I heard today? I heard something. In a book? No, it was Andrew Tate. My wife sent me a clip from Andrew Tate and Candace Owens, Candace Owens interview, and he was talking about, "I wish my I wish my childhood was a lot rougher, or if my dad had been mean to me or or um, messed me up." He said something along the lines of, uh, "He wished his childhood would be rough," which is the right perspective to have to not be defeated by your circumstances. So yeah, in that mindset and that, you know, I kind of feel the same. I, you know, have I made mistakes? Sure. Have they served to help inform my future and build my character, make me a better man? I think so. So no. What else? How would you encourage someone to stay positive in today's world? or even less broadly, just someone in their immediate life going through a hard times, how would I encourage you? I think life works in cycles. I mean, I don't know everything, but um, generally speaking, I think we're in for some hard times, but Every time there's hard times, it's that whole, you know, strong men create good times, good times create soft men, soft men create hard times, hard times create strong men. So if it gets hard, hey, we're going to get strong. That's good. If life's hard on you right now, if you have the right mindset, if you can get the right mindset, right here in James. Let's find it, James 1. Oh, look at that. Blessed is the man who perseveres under trial, because when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. Talked about that last week. Talking about enduring and trials and persecution. In the beginning of James, is James 1, 2, it says, Consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking in anything. The hardship makes you, makes you hard in a good way. Hey, man. What did I, I wrote something really fun some t- one time about jewelry. Um... forget what it was something about going through the fire though so if you're in it on the other side of it you're going to be stronger it's just like kanye says what does he say in that song bigger faster stronger something like that harder better faster stronger yeah there you go all right final videos i actually got a few and i want to see uh chorus's reaction can you watch the videos and your reaction that'd be fun yeah, so I have this one. This one you hadn't heard about. So oh, yeah. we'll get your two cents on this first. So this is a costume that someone paid multiple no. thousands of dollars to turn themselves into this dog. This is not CGI. No, this is real life. This is in Japan. This is a person. Yeah, so this is what happens to a society post-nuclear explosion, I think. This is a human being. That's a human being. Yeah, that's a Japanese man. Is that not the worst thing you've seen? In a while, at least. Oh, my gosh. I don't even understand. I don't even understand how that's possible. Like, surgery how? No, it's not surgery. It's a costume. Oh. 
Yeah, no, there's no way that's surgery. Anyway, I don't know if there's like a broader explanation for why this is happening in the world, but that happened this week. That's oh yeah, that was on the New York Post. So if you had a, if you had to give advice to a friend who wants to turn into a dog, Chad, what would you tell them? I would say, look at Pee Wee. What's next? Okay, you ready for this? That was bad. These two kayakers were kayaking in a popular whale watching location when suddenly they were swallowed by a humpback whale. Oh sh! Oh sh! Speechless and unable to help, the onlookers watched in horror. Oh, a second camera angle captures this horrifying oh my moment gosh. in I think even I have better quality. Thankfully, the humpback whale quickly spit them back out, and the kayakers were unharmed. What would you do in that situation? Become a prophet. <laughs> Obey the Lord. Yeah, pretty quickly, you're like, what was I not doing that <laughs> yeah. I was supposed to be doing? I guarantee they got back and they were like, thinking about Jonah. All right, now you react to the... I think I have a few, right? Let me pull them up. I found the best uh, Instagram uh, account. I don't know if I want to tell you. You can probably see it, though. If you're watching, you'll see it. But I'm not going to tell you if you're just audio. Gotta okay, we've got the first clip here. This clip has no audio. That's all right. Okay. We're watching... Oh, what? Did they do that to his hair? How did that work? What happened? <laughs> what is going on? <laughs> I have no idea, honestly. That is the most bizarre thing. <laughs> when I watch a video and this dude is completely bald. And then the next clip, he's got like braids. After his barber gets to him? I don't know what I'm looking at here. Should I click through these or is that it? Uh, I think, uh, did I give you three of them? Let me pull up the next one. It might go back to the same one. I don't know if you have to go to the different uh, whatevers. Yeah, I have to click through. Okay. Just click through them all. Let's watch them all. Some of them are pretty rough. Okay, here we go. This is a, a clown. They done what caught it happened? in Mexico? I, I don't remember this one. A clown in the back seat. Oh, oh this no. One's rough. Oh, my gosh. I don't even know how to describe this. <laughs> Oh my. Well, let's go to you. I want to oh see you react. That is heinous. That is not right. We're yeah, seeing we're, like moldy, yeah, cracked <laughs> toes. <laughs> yeah, we're seeing like, oh my gosh, these are like from another species. The like toenails are just not right. Um, and someone is recording a video. And they're uh, at a under, urinal. Yeah, yeah, or, uh, yeah, under a bathroom stall. Oh my God. No shoes? That has to be fake, right? No, I don't know. I that saw dude's crazy. feet that were that way on this account a couple days ago. Oh my gosh. And okay, what else do we fake. have here? Oh man, that's there. rough. Oh, Wait. you got sound on this one? Uh, no. This post doesn't have sound. Bummer. I know. It did, it did have sound. It's supposed to be like an ASMR. That was the second one. So there should be one more that I meant to put. Oh, and I forgot the plug. Nope. Oh, that's not right. This dude caught a spider under a bucket. Oh. And now it's in the bucket. Is it going to jump at the screen? That's not cool. What that happened? has to be fake, Did right? he lose it? Oh, it's my his God. Face. It transports to his face. There's no. no way. There's no way. That can't be right. That's not real. That's like a prop or something. It went to his face? What is that? I don't want to see that. I gotta get off of that. <laughs> <laughs> did, did, was there a third video? Because I don't think. Uh, let me see. Well, he looks for that. Uh, thank you for sticking to the end. The 24 hour secret sale code is raw milk. Go to chadbarala.com, and this is good for all the Saint Poncho candles. This is good on the new collection here. Only for 24 hours after this show goes live, which is at 9 o'clock a.m. Mountain Standard Time on Friday, which is today. All right, we got our last clip. Here we go. Let's see what's up with this. Oh, no. Oh, my gosh. That is not right. I can't, I can't describe that for that. If you're only, if oh, you're only listening. Oh, he hits it when he goes up with the glasses, too. <laughs> 
<laughs> there, there's this man <laughs> with <It's>, uh, <laughs> having to describe this for the listeners is terrible. He's got like two noses. He has two noses <laughs> because he has a mole the size of his nose. Oh my god, on his forehead, and, and he, he just rests, rests his glasses sunglasses on up on that. That is not cool. Oh, uh, well, that's uncomfy. That was the perfect ending to this episode. <laughs> I think. Well, well if done. you could hear what he was saying, he said, if life gives you lemons, cut them in half and squirt them in someone's eyes, something along those lines. <coughs> All right. Thank you so much for watching the show. Like the show. Send it to a friend. Subscribe to the channel. Love you. Bye.